So that's a good lead-in. You know, how do you prevent the Dead Sea effect? You build a good organization, and you maintain it and you protect it. Uh, let's do. Let's go ahead and do armor here. Uh, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll do the command month, and then we'll talk about work shirts. As I mentioned. I had not, ironically, I have his book, uh, The Laws of Software Process, but I'd never read this appendix until I took over this class from, from Chuck. Uh, and this is now, this is, be, this is probably one of the most significant and important things I've read in the last year and a half in terms of software engineering because it explains so much. He has this interesting concept that says software is a knowledge storage medium, which is, which is sort of hard to wrap your mind around, but it's true. Basically, you're encoding knowledge. When you develop software, you're encoding knowledge into the code for it to carry out and act upon that knowledge. The problem is the knowledge it's encoding has to do with solving the problem we're trying to solve. We seldom know how to solve the problem ahead of time. If we did, then we could go out and buy the software. Someone else would have already solved it. You know, how many of you are, are at this point planning on going out, launching, and writing a new desktop publishing system? It's kind of like, why would I bother? There's, there's like, you know, a couple dozen out there. It's a big project. You know, I'm simply going to go out and buy Microsoft Word or whatever I want to use uh, to do actually desktop publishing. Uh, it was still big market back in 1990, which is almost 30 years ago. Uh, so, by nature, there is an inherent inefficiency in software development. We are discovering what we don't know and what we don't know how to solve. And the problem is, is it's, it's unavoidable that our process will be less than efficient. Because it's something you don't know how to do yet. You already know how to do it. You're simply writing a program you've written before. Now, there are times when that's valuable. It's like, you know, I wrote one game. I'm gonna, you know, I have one side scroller game. I'm writing a second side scroller game. And the delta is only this. But there's that little bit that, you know, unless you're literally writing the same game, there is something new you're doing. And you go to do it, and it's like, well, this doesn't work. I have to do this, and I have to do this. Uh, how many of you in software projects have discovered that you've run into unknowns that have forced things to take a lot longer than you expected? Yeah. It's, it's the nature of the beast. Anyone want to volunteer some personal experiences that painfully come to mind? Yeah. Um, so using a technology called React Native, when you're debugging it, it's, it's running through Chrome. So uh -huh. it uses Chrome's V8 JavaScript engine. When it runs on a device, it uses um, JavaScript Core, which is the engine that runs on Safari. So there's a lot of things that'll work that are kind of newer features that are included in Chrome's engine that aren't included in JavaScript Core. So you'll go and you'll, you know, you'll debug it, it'll all work, and you'll put it on a real device, and you'll be like, oh, what's happening? And this is working. And you'll show you And you figure that out, and you can fix it. But yep. Other other suggestions anyone wants to volunteer? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. So Kevin Search, I was re rebuilding like a little viewer app, like really, really small, one page. Like all it did is load some content. It turns out there were a lot of issues that made like my refactoring or rebuilding of it in the framework look almost like the original because all the text was submitted in just RTF files. So basically I'd accept whatever crazy style and whoever put an article I put in there. Nothing I could do about it really without completely destroying the formatting. And all the images were from sourced from different locations, whether it was on like the development server or the production server. So everything was a great in development and then would totally break all the images in production. I just had no idea what's going on. I had to have a guy who was familiar with it explain and fix it. So yep. Awesome. I had a piece of software that I was working on, which um, it kept having specific issues with overriding certain things that it shouldn't have and doing things in the wrong order. Um, the very frustrating thing is if you put it in debug mode, it uh, worked perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we called it a Heisenberg. Yeah. I've been there. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> 
We eventually found out it was a timing issue. Uh, so being in debug mode fixed the timing issue. But uh, yeah, that was incredibly frustrating to figure out. I'll give you a great story. The uh, first space shuttle launch, I worked on the space shuttle flight simulators at NASA from 79 to 80, then I moved over to the Lunar Planetary Institute next door. My office mate, Carolyn, her husband was working on the IBM software that actually ran on the space shuttles. The very first space shuttle launch was scrubbed. Uh, it took 48 hours, and it was actually her husband who tracked down the bug. But the problem is that <coughs> you have there's what's called the launch processing system, which I, was actually what I worked on in the simulator. It was a simulation for the LPS, which is on the ground at Cape uh, Kennedy that runs the shuttle until 30 seconds before launch. And then it turns over to the onboard computers. And I can talk about those. There's actually five. They vote. Uh, it turns it over to them, and they take control of the shuttle at 30 seconds before launch. They launch. It turned out there was a 40 microsecond real-time discrepancy between the launch processing system and the onboard shuttle. And every time it tried to turn over the onboard shuttle, it said, no, I'm not ready yet. And it just kept passing, and it, they, it, would, it wouldn't hand off. Basically, the shuttle said, no, no, I'm not going to take control. Uh, and it, it took them uh, uh, two days of frantic debugging <laughs> <laughs> to figure out that that error had occurred. Uh, and to come up with a fix for it. Any other? No, I just want to move on. Okay. What can happen along the way? Problem of late discovery. Blind alleys and significant backtrack. Uh, I have one of the articles which you'll actually have assigned to read later on is to not defer the difficult. As programmers, and especially as managers, we want to look good. We want early progress. We want to be on track. So what do we do? We do all the easy stuff. We do the low-hanging fruit. We do the, you know, we mock things up and we can make this work and we can make this work and we can make this work. And what we end up doing is all the really hard stuff, which usually includes the stuff that we don't know how to do yet, we push off. And we keep working on the stuff that we do know how to do. And then you get to a point where you have to go to the hard stuff. And at times, you can find that you've basically gone down a blind alley. That you've pursued a solution path, and to take the next step and do the hard stuff, it just won't work. And you have to start backtracking. It's one of the reasons why source code control systems are so important. Uh, the other problem you often will have is that you will have you have deferred, say, half a dozen hard problems, and you've pursued a path towards each of them, and then when you start trying to solve them, you find that your paths are incompatible with each other. If I solve this for here, then I can't accomplish this over here. If I solve this here, I can't accomplish this over here. So there, there are problems of what doesn't work and what does. You need to gain that knowledge. But sometimes what doesn't work is often just as valuable, but it's discarded. This is why turnover can be so critical in an organization. You know, I'm working on something for two years. I've actually come close to a solution. Uh, and along the way, I have tried these alternate paths and said, no, that's not going to work. Suddenly, I get a great offer. I leave. I go somewhere else. I spent two weeks with someone and say, hey, this is how it works. And that person starts recreating the same learning process I went through. Say, well, why didn't they just do this? I'll go do this. And spends a month on that and says, oh, that's not working. Well, I'll do this instead. And spends a month on that and that doesn't work. Uh, and he talks about corrupted knowledge. OK, how many of you are diligent about purging non-working code out of your systems? You will find, thank you. you that's good. That's a very good practice, because what you will often find, uh, and I, I can speak to this not just as a software engineer, but as an expert witness where I've had to analyze software systems, is I'll get this big batch of source code, and one of the biggest problems I have right after that is figuring out what's live code and what's leftover code that, that actually isn't used, isn't in production. Uh, huh? 
I never finished. <laughs> I never finished. Yeah. The, uh, and so <coughs> if that gets left in there, someone new comes along and picks up and says, oh, this must be important for some reason. I actually, I actually had a case as an expert witness where I had to revise my whole expert report. Well, not my whole expert report. But I had to revise a significant portion of my expert report because my analysis of the working software had assumed the certain section of code was actually used, and I discovered very late, uh, like after I had submitted my initial expert report, that that code actually wasn't functioning code. I, of course, felt like an idiot. Uh, you know, I'm an expert witness. I'm supposed to know this stuff and so on. But there was, there was basically, there was a deposition of one of the people on the other side, one of the former programmers, who said, no, no, that, that wasn't working code. That was, that was something just set up behind an old break. I look like an idiot now. Uh, and had a, had a bit of a fight just to go back and uh, get that, get my report revised uh, to reflect the appropriate reflection software. Uh, any experience or observations you've had with this? About going down an alley trying to solve a problem in a particular way and having to abandon that approach because you found it just didn't work? Yes? So, at my work, I was working on a proxy server. And Speak up a little, sir. Here. I was working on a proxy server, and we were trying to do it using Squid, and after five months of working on it, we found solution that got working in four hours. <laughs> oh, you know, there, there, there's this pain of losing five months and the joy of actually getting a working solution in four hours, but that's still, that's still painful. Uh, other experiences? And yes? So we were writing a piece of code for a new application, and uh, there was a lot of image processing involved in there. We fetched the member's image, crop it, put it in a nice little circle, and now, Node had good libraries to do that, Node.js, but they usually involve you installing extra dependencies on your system. It turns out you develop the whole thing, works great on your system, you put pull requests, it goes to deploy a uh, test service, the boxes that it's deploying, the box support that plug -in. So now we have to go back, rewrite the whole thing, use something that does those plugins. So yeah, fun stuff. Yeah. I mean, the point here is that this is not this is not an error. This is a natural and inherent and unavoidable part of the software process. This is trial and discovery. What the discovery process looks like. <laughs> you can see the peak. It's kind of like, okay, that's what I want to build. And you start into the weeds. Uh, and you you know run into quicksand and you run into rock walls and it's kind of like you have to backtrack and do this. This is actually a significant issue in intellectual property cases that I work on as an expert witness, uh, as, as well as failed project, which is <clears throat> if I come in, do the analysis, uh, do the design, you know, extract all this information, figure out what an approach is, and then you fire me, but you want to keep using my work process. It's like you've gained value. I have saved you, you know, X number of dollars of effort on your part because I've done all this discovery. So I actually have done something of value that you need to pay me for. Uh, and then you have what, what it yields. And what he shows here is the, the solid line is actual knowledge acquisition and the dotted line are basically abandoned efforts. Efforts where you go down a path and you say that's not going to work. You spend, you know, five months with Squid approach, and it's like, no, that's not going to work, and you come back and get a solution almost immediately on a different path. Uh, <clears throat> so what you have here is that the progress, as you see, it isn't a straight line going across. You keep branching off in different directions and backtracking, and you find something that works for a while. There we go. I keep pointing at my laptop. You can't see it, can you? Uh, <laughs> there we go. So you you know you get to an end, say this is a dead end. You come back and you find a solution for a while, and then you go and this is a dead end. You backtrack to there, and you're making progress, and you follow to another dead end, and you backtrack, and you start making progress. So this is you have a lot of effort that goes into it, 
which doesn't pay off, except to the extent as you know what not to do. Uh, the problem, and uh, the, the <coughs> key issue here, this is one of the core reasons why software estimation is so hard. Because you don't know what you don't know. Sometimes you don't, you know what you don't know. You know, if someone asked me, well, you know, we're going to use Unreal Engine and we're going to do this with, with what would you code if you're using it? Um, C++ if you want to do it the hard way. Okay, what if I want to do it the easy way? Uh, they, have a visual, they have a visual scripting language called Blueprint, which okay. does it so, simple. You know, I'm not familiar with either Unreal Engine or Blueprint. So if I'm going to do something with Unreal Engine, I know I'm going to have come up to speed of Blueprint and it's come up to speed of the engine. I'm going to learn all the mistakes that a novice is going to make, you know, make, and so on and so yeah. forth. But I might not know that there's something I want to put in my game that Unreal Engine just can't do until I actually do that. Or as with with one of the projects last semester, they were using Unreal Engine, and but they're trying to do it cross-platform. They discovered that things, as as much as someone mentioned, things work differently <laughs> on the two platforms with Unreal Engine. Something they, they, they would work fine here would not work over here or would look you know substantially different. Yes. Since I'm on the Unreal team, what were the two platforms? Uh, I, I don't know, but if you go back to the go back to the fall of 2017, okay. it's it was I think their the side scroller game that they were doing. Okay. Um, <coughs> observation on this graph. I felt like he was really um, conservative on his unknowledge path. Like, in my real life, I've seen that. There's a lot more dashed lines on my graph than this other Part of that comes with time and experience. Uh, the, uh, and yes, if, if depending on the level of unfamiliarity with the you know, environment, engines, libraries, language, the problem area itself, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we're a year late shipping pages is Doing a word processor is hard. Uh, you know, Next Step had a built-in text editor, but that that wasn't didn't even begin to touch what we needed to do. The simple issue of making letters appear on the screen within a tenth of a second of the button being pressed. Users will not accept anything slower than that. Doing that while doing everything else that you needed to do in real time was one of the biggest challenges. Footnotes were a challenge. Oh my gosh. Footnotes. Footnotes were just a nightmare because they follow very bizarre and arcane rules and you know, text gets long and you push a footnote to the next page and suddenly it goes down and wants to put a footnote and brings it back and you get these race conditions. Uh, we solved it, but it was it was not easy. Yes. I notice one of those lines starts to go backwards. Is that Kind of symbolic of where you think you have to backtrack and then you throw that away and go back to where you initially I I'm not sure what he uh, specifically meant for that. Don't read too much into the graph. Yeah. It's, it's lines. <laughs> he, he, he may have meant that or he may have said that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. So his five orders of ignorance. Uh Zero order ignorance is that I know something, I know that I know it, and I can demonstrate that I know it. Okay. Uh, first order, I don't know something, and I know I don't know it. Using Unreal Engine. You know. uh, I don't know how to use Unreal Engine, and I know I don't know how to use Unreal Engine. Uh, I don't know something, and I don't know that I don't know it. Until you clarified it for me, I wasn't sure what I would use to program on Unreal Engine. Right. Yeah, you told me blueprint. Okay, now I've, I've learned that. I've moved from second order to first order. Uh, third order is I lack a process where, by which I discover that I don't know I don't know something. You're all gone, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, what do I use to program in Real Engine? My laptop shut down. I can't use Google. I'm stuck here in this room, and I can't learn it. Uh, fourth order is I, I don't know about the five orders of ignorance. You all know about the five orders now. You've read this. Theory. <clears throat> so apply the software to system. Zero order is I know how to complete the system. I know how to finish completely the program. You know, someone wants me to write a binary search program. I can, I can still write a binary search program from memory. Okay. 
Uh, I could probably rise a FizzBuzz program with, with that much problem. I would hope. Anyway, first order, I know what I need to know to complete the system. Okay, I'm going to do something. Uh, I have a game design, which I worked on a few years ago and haven't done anything with, but I know pretty much I've done computer games I've, uh, before. Uh, I've done programming before. There's nothing terribly innovative in terms of coding with the game. So pretty much I know what I need to know to complete the system. Second order, I don't know yet what I will need to know to complete the system. That's sort of the point we were at starting with pages. We're doing a design-oriented desktop publishing system under next step. Operating system we, you know, I had familiarity with. I had done some Objective-C programming. Most developers coming in hadn't. Uh, but I'd never done a desktop publishing system. Uh, and so there, you know, you have, it's like, I'm not sure. I'm still in the learning process figuring what I'm going to do. Third order is where you're stuck. I don't know how to find out what I need to know. If I don't, if I can't figure out how to discover what I need to know, then I can't move myself up the chain here. And fourth order is I have no clue about any of the issues above. That's management. Uh, <laughs> I say that with some affection. Uh, he's got a chart here. I'll let you read the article and go to the chart. <coughs> So the process, applying the software development. First, we need to identify what we don't know. A lot of you are going through this. In fact, I, I dare say most of you may be going through this in your separate groups. It's kind of like, okay, we've got this idea, we want to do this project. What don't we know? What, what technologies, what issues about it are we not clear of yet? Uh, what questions do we need to ask to resolve that? How do we find this out? You know, we're doing a search for online. Uh, are there libraries? Are there tutorials? Uh, are there special tools we can get? Are there existing solutions we can use? Uh, then we need to get the answers in a form that we can actually use. Uh, the problems he point out is the classic, you know, the, the classic dictum, the more I know, the less I know. Uh, speaking at age 64, I can tell you that. I'm, I'm quite ignorant. Uh, the acquiring knowledge illuminates the lack of knowledge. It's kind of like, Oh wait, I have this, and I have to learn this, you know, and I have to do this, and here's the set of problems. You know, I may say, okay, I'm going to use uh, Unreal Engine and Blueprint, and oh, there's a whole set of idioms and uh, patterns and approaches that I need to use in using it, so I've got to figure out how to, to learn them. <clears throat> the humans have not found a way to empirically measure knowledge. This goes to the software estimation issue. If you're not sure what you don't know, and you have no way of measuring how much, what percentage of what you need to know you currently know, then how do you know when you're going to be done? It's all a crapshoot. It's kind of like, well, I think, I think we'll have it done in three. Yeah, I think we're 80% done. Yeah, based on what? Uh, <clears throat> the critical measure of knowledge in the software is that of the knowledge not in the software. Uh, which means the stuff that I have yet to learn uh, and I need to use in order to put knowledge into the software. Questions, thoughts, feedback, puzzlement. Now ready for a biology break. Yes? So in this book on Man Month, and I think in some of the other recent readings, there are a lot of methods for estimations of completion of game. <coughs> how would those methods compare to just like, this is how many features we've built so far and that we're like in acceptance? And then this is how many that we need for shipping, or is software just not built? So there have really been, I, I have, I've got probably half a dozen books on software estimation, the big, thick one by Capers Jones and so on. It remains, it remains one of the single toughest problems because <coughs> there's, it's, it's, it, and it's why. Your, your approach, I think, has a fundamental good thing. It's like, okay, here's the feature set we have. Here's how many features we want. You will hear me say this almost every class period. If you want to deal with a slipping schedule, what do you do? You cut features. And particularly, you cut the features that you are least sure about how to implement. It's like, we don't know how to make this work. Let's cut that one. 
We know how to make this other one work, therefore we can come up with a relatively high confidence level it's going to take us a month to put this in because we know what we're going to do, we have the information and so on. This other one, it's going to require investigation, we're going to try different solutions, there's some hard stuff in here. Let's cut that one. You just increased your level of confidence in your schedule. There have been any number of efforts that say, okay, with you know function points or estimated lines of code or this or that, you know, it's going to take roughly this long. There's one famous model, Kokomo 2, uh, which <coughs> uh, I was in a case where the other side was using that to estimate the worth of a piece of software uh, by plugging in all these parameters. And I showed that by they, they were making assumptions for, it, it uses like 20 or 30 parameters, and they had maybe eight that they had actual values for, that many. And I showed that by using different assumptions on all the other parameters, I could get a 2,500 to 1 variance. In the estimate for how much, how long the code would take. Uh, so that's a problem with a lot of the estimation models. Other thoughts or questions? If you haven't read this, you should have. But if you haven't read it, please try to. Was there a hand going up? So, yes. Yeah, it, the question was kind of already asked. Um, I think two weeks ago. But what do you tell management when they ask you when is this going to be done? Yeah. Like. <coughs> How are you supposed to explain, oh, you're at the we fifth order of ignorance. We don't know. <laughs> you're supposed to tell them, oh, you're at the fifth order of ignorance, like you don't even know what you're supposed to do. Actually, what, what, you, what you need to do, and this, this is why this is such, in my opinion, such an important document. You know, grab, grab the PDF, take it with you. Uh, you may not get your manager to read it, but it provides a nice framework for addressing that problem, which is to say, here's what we know. Here's what we have done. Here's what we know. Here are the remaining features. For each feature, here is how much we know and know how to solve. Here's how much we don't know, but we know how to get the information to solve it. Here are things for that feature that we don't know and we don't know yet how to solve it. That provides sort of first order effort to allow the manager to assess, as I said, the relative potential cost of that feature. And you can say, if we pursue this, you know, for this feature, we pretty much know, and it's just going to take a certain amount of work, and we, you know, we can estimate it will be roughly three weeks. Managers like that. It's like, okay, we, we're, you know, we have a high level of confidence we can do this three weeks. This other feature, we don't know yet how to solve it. You know, we could solve it quickly. We could reduce the feature to a set that we do know how to solve, which is one solution. But if you really want this whole feature set, we're going to have some exploration in there. We're going to have to figure out how to solve it, and we don't have a good estimate. It could happen quickly. We could find ourselves in a situation where, as with the squid example, we never get it to work. That happens. Uh, that happens quite often. Uh, and given all the other issues that can arise within a software project, and that's, that's assuming everyone's on board, competent, knows what they're doing, the manager knows what she or he is doing, so on and so forth. If you add in some of the other human factors, it can it can be a real disaster. And we're back to Fred Brooks, you know, how does a project get to be a year late, one day at a time? And a lot of those one day at a time slips are from the lack of knowledge and the effort to try and cure that ignorance. Let's take a break until quarter after or so. And we'll start, and we have two things left. We have three chapters on this for man month. And then we're going to talk about building an organization and an org chart. So. Yes. I'll say what I have. I have things I can